Hey everybody, welcome to another Baseball America podcast. I'm Kyle Glazer. We're happy to be joined today by USA Baseball National Team General Manager Eric Campbell. Eric played an integral part in putting together the Team USA roster that will be going to Premier 12 and try to qualify for the Olympics for the United States as well. Eric, putting together a roster like this, what was kind of the overarching theme? Obviously, you were limited to non-40-man roster players, which added a wrinkle into the process. But how did it kind of come together, and what did you guys want to try and accomplish with this roster? Well, we, we had to be realistic about who's going who's gonna to be able to pitch in, in November. So, you know, we needed to look worldwide. And, uh, and in great credit to the clubs, um, 14 of our 15 pitchers are going to come from the the minor the you know the teams in minor in, in major league baseball so if I, if you would have asked me that this time last year you know i'm, I'm not sure uh, that we would have had that but with the shortening of the fall league uh, i think that aided us that there's still pitchers that um, you know in the past would have would have pitched into to november in the fall league and this year they're not because the fall is going to end on October 26. So I think we benefited from from that change, and uh, we're certainly excited that uh, that we do have a what we think is a great pitching staff. Yeah, with that pitching staff, one of the things that jumped out to me looking at the rosters was the diversity of arms. Uh, you have some power arms, guys like Spencer Howard and Tyler Johnson. You have some more pitchability guys like Parker Dunchy. Uh, you have Side Armor and Wyatt Mills. And then you also have some veteran guys like a Clayton Richard. How much was that a focus of you guys trying to kind of be able to ha- bring out different looks to your pitching staff? Uh, like I said some power guys, some pitchability guys, uh, different arm slots. How much was that a conscious effort you guys yeah. made? I think I think it becomes secondary. I think you go after. I think you, you look at performers and you go out and you and you look at who's performed and you try to study and say, okay, this, does this guy still potentially have innings left in, in his year? Is he is he gonna go to winter ball? You know, is he is this is this just a way to you know an extension of what he normally does? Is he going to winter ball? Is he gonna be ready? Um, so when you look at it, you, 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 number one, you look at performers and then when you get permission to talk to a player and you would get consensus with the committee, that you're going to put him on a team. You start to look at the unique ability, you know? Um, so if you go to a veteran, uh, like, like Richard, you know, obviously, um, I think, I think some of the terms used, you know, that, nothing's going to phase him in, in this event. You know, he's, he's not going to see anything he hasn't seen before uh, but then you then you could contrast that with someone like Tyler Johnson who's been on the mound with us in Taiwan in Japan in Cuba in our in our nation's uniform on the collegiate national team and you also have great confidence that, that he's not going to be phased as well because he's worn this uniform as as well so you, know, you, you could take it from one extreme to the other uh, but you, but you still want you just you still get to a point where when you make an act, make an invite that you really believe this person's gonna gonna help us, and that's that's where we think we are. You made reference to the innings and how many innings they had left. What was kind of the the innings number you were looking at for guys to see? Okay, if they threw well, this many, we think this they have the innings they can give us. Yeah, certainly. You're throughout the process. You know, you're you're looking at transactions starting in April. You know, you're asking Brad Young and his team to give you transactions and. You know, does, is is someone going to miss time because of a non-arm injury? You know, is someone is someone going to miss time because of an oblique situation or whatever it may be? You know, an ankle, a knee, whatever, whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden, you know, is is do you start forecasting innings uh, available? So, you know, I, I could go, I could give you my philosophy, but that doesn't really make too much sense. It's more about what's what's understood. So. So maybe somewhere, if it's a younger prospect, maybe between that 130 and 140, you know, net innings for a year is probably somewhere where if we think we would we would be way above that with with our uh, 10 to 10 to 18 innings um, for for any given pitcher, um, 
that, that, that may be too much for someone who hasn't done that before. So that's so, so so really we start if we start looking at 130, 135 and we start adding ten to eighteen from from what we're looking for, maybe we do project that we're not gonna get permission to speak to the athlete. So you mentioned this process starting in April and the process of speaking to the athletes. Take us through the process. You guys started identifying well, potential yeah, targets. I think it's important to say that with all of our programs at USA Baseball, since the Premier 12 um, in November of 2015 ended, there's been international points accumulated over this, this quad, you know, and to, to getting to this point. So kudos to all our programs at USA Baseball for making us the number two ranked team in the world behind Japan and the fact that we're qualified for the, for the premier 12. And, and then you, you know, you start to, you, you start to go out. We, we met with uh, just about every club in the month of March in Arizona and in um, Florida and met with their minor league staff and talked about the event. Um, and then you get into the process of, of hiring staff. You know, you, you go out and you, you hire a, a great field staff and as, as details of the tournament start coming to you, um, you, you start putting together a training camp and, and put everything on paper. And then you, then you go out and with the help of some great folks in the, in the game of baseball and in the industry that just that help us for the love of, of team USA, um, love of our uniform, they help us identify, um, the athletes that, that it should be invited to this team. So, and that becomes really that ramped up closer to the all-star break. And then, and then really every week became hot and heavy from, from the big league all-star break on, um, that, uh, through, through, through October 3rd, when we, we had to submit our final roster, um, there was, there was intense calls every week and sometimes multiple calls during a week, to, to get to as a group uh, to get to invites and then and then you know then once you have an invite out you got to go to the, the player and, and explain everything to him um, there may you know with, with with players their their agents may have questions they may come back with more questions and, and eventually you get a yes or a no on on the offer so it's it's always an exciting process and we're fortunate with with the great pool of players we have. In the, in the USA, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make a lot of mistakes on because <laughs> because we, you know, the team we have is going to be great. Uh, but there's there's other versions of the team that, that won't be on the field that would equal would be equally as great. So, you know, there's there's lots of components. So you mentioned you guys really start contacting teams. Uh, the players are identified. You have a committee of, of a dozen or so scouts that scour the nation and provide recommendations. You guys start contacting teams. Once the team gives you permission yeah. to invite the player, the player could still potentially say yes or no? Oh, yeah. The player may say, you know what, it's just this doesn't work. You know, for whatever reason, and we don't, you know, we don't, if, if the club says no, we don't get into whatever the club tells us. Then that's there. You know, we don't we don't try to explore that. It's either yes or no. We move on. If we get a yes, then we go to that player and we and we and we make a great pitch. And uh, and for whatever reason, he may he may say he can't do it, and we just you know we move on. We're not uh, we're not going to belabor that. He he knows what he should be doing in November, and if, and if this doesn't fit, then it doesn't fit. So. So when in the process do you guys engage the players, and, and t- when are the teams engaged? As soon as, soon as they, uh, if, if our committee, if our committee says, you know what, we should ask this player to play on the team, um, then we get permission from the club, and it's immediate. You know, so if the club says yes, the club may, you know, the club may say yes, but, but uh, let us talk to him first. Yeah, or the club may say yes. Here's his here's his cell phone number, and we go. It's it's immediate. In most cases, um, when when Paul Seiler reaches our CEO reaches out to a player, you know, in most cases, Paul doesn't even get through the the whole pitch. You know, most most players are like, hey, let's hey, you know what, <laughs> let's go. I'm on. I'm going. And so, you know, that's that's always a pleasure too. You know, when it's it's, it's usually pretty immediate. You know, but but then again, every every player has to evaluate it and. There may be things that um, 
that a player brings up to us and, and he just can't at this time in his life he just can't accept that offer so you guys finish up with a 28-man roster how many players do you guys ask permission <laughs> for to get to that final 28 oh it, it'd be an estimate but we probably view i mean shoot we probably we probably view stats if, if there's 28 we probably we probably view stats on on uh, 280 players and uh in terms of a reach in in terms of a, of a reach you know any any given exercise th- throughout the years uh, for our professional national teams if there's 28 we we may have we may have had 40 outreaches you know on average on any given year with all the guys you reached out to the final product of the national team was certainly a, a very very talented group that really stood out for uh, the high-level prospects as well as the veteran mix. Uh, the final total, 22 prospects, six veterans with Major League time. How did you guys settle on that being the mix you guys wanted? I, I think, you know, I think that you just, you just think that you look, you just, you know, you get, you just get, there's, there's, this thing has evolved since the, since a lot of the pro coverage guys started jumping in in, in 2006 when we started doing this. I just think there's if we, if we as we as administrators you know we know we might only have an hour with the committee if if the conversation is pushed pushed in a certain direction at a certain position you know we'll open it up and we'll try to we'll try to pick apart why we should or should do this but it becomes at this point in 2019 it becomes pretty clear that we should ask this. We should ask on this player, and, and so that it's just kind of a process where you start. You know, there's a lot of easy picks in that regards, and then, uh, and then it becomes hard. You know, it, it's 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 easy to ask a player to play for his nation, but you know, there's, there's times when it it may get down to player X, Y, or Z, and you just gotta you gotta spend more time, and uh, you, you know, once you've already built part of the roster. You start seeing, you know, right left balance in the batter's box, um, you know, right left balance on on the mound, and who, you know, who can close, who can match up, who has a little bit of length on, on the mound. You just start you start talking about what what you know what a player can bring to the team, and and uh, it's it's hard, you know, it's 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 hard to to, to not ask players sometimes that you you you've either known because they're alumni and they they've been such great performers in the past and, and and you're not able to ask on this particular particular assignment you know you, you can't ask them this time and that hurts but you still you know you go to the process and you, and you say who performed and what makes most sense for the team and so they're, they're, they're hey that's that's fun baseball conversations right there you know and then and then we may do all that work and and, it, and it's you know the the one two three guys that you discuss maybe three of those guys are not available so you start all over again at that particular uh, you know point in the conversation in regards to the conversations one of the most interesting things to me that jumped out was how many teams were willing to send their very very top prospects to play for team usa particularly on the position player side joe adele alec bohm andrew vaughn drew waters what's that conversation like with those teams about getting their top prospects to come play for team uh, usa i think you know I, I, hopefully hopefully there's a great comfort in, in our product um i hope you know, we, we, we tell play, we tell players and and anybody in baseball in the in the USA that uh, you know we're the we're the caretaker of, of we, what we think is one of the greatest baseball uniforms out there, and and then you know the players that get asked, they're USA baseball, it's their uniform, and uh, and, and so you know it, it just it kind of happens. Um, and I and I just hope there's you know I think and I hope that there's great trust with with who we're going to put on the on the field because they're they're USA baseball but the the field staff is 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 more USA baseball than than I am perhaps I've been helping USA baseball since 1994 but when when a manager or a pitching coach are on the field um, they're USA baseball 
And uh, so I feel proud about being the caretaker of a, of a great uniform. And I think that because we've had such great people come through and there, there's such buy-in to it, that I think there's comfort in letting a player play in his nation's uniform. And I think, I think we're going to do things right at every turn. So generally speaking, most of these teams, when you call and say, hey, we want Joe Adele, they're willing? Uh, yeah, I can only paraphrase, but I think that for the most part, the, the clubs want to find a way to say yes. You know, if they can't, they can't. We don't belabor that because at the end of the day, we, we fielded a great team. And we and 27 of the 28 players are from 30 clubs. So that, that just tells you right there and then that they're trying to get the yes, you know, when this when this uniform comes around. You mentioned the workload you look for with pitchers. How much does that come into play with position players at all? Some of these guys did miss time with injuries or only played half the season. How much does workload come into it when you're selecting position players? Well, I think selfishly we want, I mean, position players, we, we love it when they're going to the fall league you know, because they're still playing. They're, st- they're still playing great baseball every day. And if you go back to the 2015 team, you know, the example is Adam Frazier, where we had an injury. Adam Frazier came onto our roster very, very late, if you remember. And he'd been in the fall league. And then not only was was he our MVP as a position player, he was the MVP of the P12 in 2015 as the most outstanding offensive player in the tournament. He was awarded that by the by the tournament. So that's one example, but we believe in it. We, we believe that, 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 that there's no better place for a guy to be once we select him than in the fall league. But if they're not in the fall league, then there's also trust. You know, we trust our players to get ready. You know, Whether they're a young player or a veteran player, there is a huge amount of trust that they understand that you know we, we've only got so many training days and then we're going to play a meaningful game on November 2nd. So... Uh, there's also a great amount of uh, a trust in, in uh, the guys that we select, even if they're not in the fall league. Yeah, it definitely did jump out how many of these guys were fall leaguers. Now, had you already made these selections before the fall league rosters were announced, but you had uh, an idea who would be there? We, so in, in, you know, in part, because just if you go back to the post-All-Star game thought, you know, there's there's players that each week were coming onto our roster then, and maybe we didn't have that information. Maybe we only had a inkling that they may or may not go to the fall league uh, but we didn't we didn't necessarily make decisions because a guy was going to the fall league um, that that just kind of you know if, if they were going we thought that was great if they weren't if they weren't going then you know we had trust that they were going to get ready absolutely in terms of the roster itself uh, a couple of interesting things jumped out at me the first one i wanted to ask you about was Two players who have two-way backgrounds made the roster, Clayton Andrews with the Brewers organization and Jake Cronenworth in the Rays organization. Did that two-way versatility play a role in the decision to put them on the roster? Um, and I think that was just, that's a bonus. For, for Clayton Andrews, I think that's a bonus that, you know, if if we're able to use him as a pinch runner, you know, or as a emergency outfielder, that's that's a bonus. But I don't think it was, it was not a primary consideration. For, for Jake, um, he's he's going to play infield only for us, so that that was not a factor. That, that we, whether or not he he could pitch or not, he's not going to pitch in this event. So okay, and then, so he's going to play he's going to play infield. Certainly, uh, him being in Durham, it was exciting to see him do an opener every once in a while, you know, and then and then get to see Brendan McKay at times come in after him. That's exciting for the game of baseball from from where I sit. You know, being a guy who was drafted as a pitcher catcher, that's that's exciting to see the game come back to that a little bit. Um, but uh, but for us, that's you know, it's a 28 man roster. We feel like with 13 position players and 15 pitchers, uh, with three games in Mexico, with seven days off before we would play in Japan if we get there, um, and then really. You know, there's there's a couple more days off intermersed into the Japan part of the of the tournament, so we feel like we're we're covered with the twenty the big roster, the twenty eight man roster. In terms of the veterans, Clayton Richard and Eric Kratz, yeah. those are the two that really jumped out. I think on paper, yeah. how did you guys come to deciding these are the two guys we want uh, to put on this roster as potential leaders of uh, this team? Well, Eric played on a team in 2010. And he was just an instant leader of that team. He was a performer on that team. And then, you know, he went on to 
you know, in, in 11 through, through 18, you know, he went on and has had a, a great career. And if you go this, just about this time last year, he was in the, he was in the national league championship series and, uh, for the Brewers. So, uh, we, we, we really, when we knew he was available, that was really an easy one for us. And, uh, and we know how he takes care of his body. Uh, we know how he controls the game. We know how he works with pitchers. We, we, we really feel like we've got another coach on the on the field by by name and Eric. Um, with with Clayton, um, certainly, you know, like I said, his as I mentioned earlier, there's not going to be anything at this event that will, will, will surprise him, will shock him that he won't be ready for. So he's. Uh, yeah, he's done a lot, and you know, in, 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 when he was in college, and then uh, as as a professional baseball player, and uh, you know, we're just we're just fortunate to have him with that kind of experience. And we, you know, we don't we have an open camp yet, but we know he'll provide leadership as well to a, to a pitching staff. On the other end of the spectrum with the younger guys, one name that did jump out was Xavier Edwards and the Padres organization. For the most part, this Team USA is guys double A and above. There are a couple exceptions, but Edwards stood out just because high schooler, spent the year at the Class A levels. What did you guys see from him that said, we think he's going to be ready well, for this competition? We, we, we wanted an element of team speed, and but but he's more than that. I mean, we go then we start looking beyond just some base stealing metric and you start getting reports on how how well he plays as a defender and uh you know how mature he is as a, as a hitter as well so even though he's 20 um the, the reports were, were all good and uh so you get you get to a point where you know, you're going to name another infielder and uh you know we're really fortunate that the, he was available and he's going to play Another really interesting selection was Noah Song, uh, who was drafted this year out of Navy by the Red Sox in the fourth round. Um, his background, just coming out of Navy, having a two-year military service requirement, how much did that have an impact on, on the decision to bring him onto Team USA? Well, you know, there's, you know, we looked at a lot of a lot of the guys that are military guys that are in the minor leagues. So John Rossoff, who's a catcher with the Tigers. And Griffin Jacks was a pitcher from Air Force in the, in the Twins organization, and uh, Jake Gilbert, who signed with the didn't, wasn't drafted but signed with the Reds this year as a, as a free agent pitcher from the Air Force Academy, and of course Noah, who was drafted in the fifth round with the Red Sox, uh, we just you know we, we believe we believe in his arm you know and, and uh, his his senior year with the ability to throw strikes and and command all of his games <clears throat> and just we know Noah a little bit and we just felt like you know what if he's available this this would be a great pick number one for for what he can do on the mound because he's, he's going to have one of the best power arms in the p12 but then again the story behind it is just you know it's a bonus were you guys trying to ensure you had at least one service academy player on the roster uh, i don't i don't think there was a goal i, I think it was just you know, it, it happened where there was a lot of excitement that if we could get him, we should get him, and it, and it happened it happened fast. And, and uh, we're, you know, we're glad we got him. So I don't know that we will set out for a quota, <laughs> but certainly these guys that um, these guys that are in a, for lack of better words, an elite athlete program from from this from the service academies. If if we do have a chance to name them, I, I think it does help. You know, I, even if we didn't select all these guys, at least having one guy in this program does help the other the other service academy players that do want to pursue a career in, in baseball. I think that um, you know that this team, this this professional national team is available uh, for Noah to, pr- to continue to pursue his, his pitching while all these other situations get worked out, you know, between the Red Sox and uh, the Navy and his pursuit to the big leagues. You mentioned a couple times wearing the USA uniform. A lot of these players have prior experience, whether it's with the 18U team, the college national team. How much of an emphasis did you guys place on prior experience playing for Team USA? 
I, th- I still think it goes back to performance. You know, we we talk, someone performs, and then it becomes great background information where uh, th- there may be scouts that don't realize that he's an alum of ours. And it's a nice layer for us to bring in and say, hey, you know, he's been to you know, he's, he's been to Taiwan, he's been to Japan, he's been to Cuba, he's been to Korea at an 18U world championship. He's been to Japan, I mean, uh, Canada at a world championship, whatever it may be. It adds a little bit of weight, um, that this person really, really understands what, what he's getting into if he accepts this, this, uh, call. And it is, it's comforting. It's, it's comforting to, to know that, you know, your alumni are, are you know, from younger programs or, or still having a chance to play on, on additional teams. You know, that's, we talk about that at every age level and, uh, you know, we're, we're glad there's a good amount of alumni on this team. And then on the older side, we, we talked about Clayton Richard and Eric Kratz and kind of the leadership they provided going after guys who have big league experience, but are not currently on 40 man rosters, yeah. Brooks Pounders, Caleb Theobar, uh, Brian Flynn. How do you guys pick out, which of those guys with major league experience you want? What's that process well, like? You know, it's just, it helps. It helps knowing that they've, they've been there. You know, that that's, that's the pinnacle of the game. And the fact that they're now maybe available to play on a, on a national team and represent their country. We, we think it can only help our team with, with, with their experience. So I, uh, it's attractive to us as we as we sit and we see there's a transaction and a, and a player X may be available. Um, certainly, we you know that's a that's that's a big thing that we want to pursue. If we can get that player, we we think it's a bonus to our team. And some of these players, like Brian Flynn, like Brooks Pounders, uh, didn't elect free agency until after the conclusion of the regular season. So even though you're starting these conversations with teams in July, it seems like this process continues to go really up through, you know, September 30th, October 1. Yeah, it does. It, it, it really does. Because there's, you know, there's there's all kinds of things that, that happen in a, in a selection process. So, um, you know, just like we're saying, we're watching, we're watching transactions every day and we're trying to see who's available. And then, when this team wraps up, hopefully we're qualified for the Olympic Games, and we'll, you know we'll begin the same process immediately the next day for our next event. You know, we talked about just from a roster construction standpoint, looking at the pitching staff, having guys, you know, right-handers, left-handers, soft tossers, power arms, uh, side armors, just all different kinds of looks. The position player side, I thought, was similarly interesting because you have some big right-handed power types in Alec Bohm and Bobby Dahlbeck and Andrew Vaughn. Uh, but you mentioned you also have some speedster types like Xavier Edwards, some middle infield types like C.J. Chatham and Jake Cronenworth who get the bat to the ball. Was there an overarching uh, philosophy in the position players you guys pursued, or were you trying yeah. to get a diversity of skill sets? You know, if you look at Alec and and Bobby and, and Andrew, you know, they're, they're right-handed power hitters, but they're also good hitters too, you know, they 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 have more ways to get RBIs than just hitting a home run. All three of them. So um, there's, you know, that's these are dangerous hitters. We do play in Mexico. We found out at the World Baseball Classic in '17 that the stadium, you know, the ball the ball will fly there. And then if you go, you know, if you're lucky enough to advance to the Tokyo Dome and then a game or two in Chiba, you know, the ball will fly in those stadiums too. So. You want you want to have balance on any team, but but certainly, you know, you want to be able to change a game. You know, you you want to be able to change a game with with an at bat too. You referenced earlier, twenty seven of the twenty eight players came from major league organizations. The one exception was Brandon Dixon, uh, former yes. Cardinals Cardinals pitcher. He now pitches for Oryx and uh, NPB in Japan. How big was that for you guys to get someone who has pitched in Japan? Considering if you advance well, out of the first round, you'll be playing in yeah, Japan. I, I, I think it's imp- important. Um, you know, we, we, we looked we looked hard at Mexico, and uh, and Kate, at one point Casey Coleman was on the roster, who who was in Tijuana and had played for us on two teams in 2015, um, and had saves, and had good saves late, and, and unfortunately he just had to come off the roster. Um, and then we looked in Korea, and there's some great performers in Korea. And of course, we looked in Japan, and there's you know there's there's a lot of uh, great American players in, in Japan, and 
and uh, certainly Brandon is closing and uh, you know in Japan to close you know when, when the game's on the line and you know especially if you're on the road in Japan and are you gonna get a, you're gonna make somebody swing the bat and miss uh, are you gonna make somebody swing and make bad contact to get your save you're probably not just gonna you're probably not gonna sit there on the road in Japan and, and get, just get strike one, strike two called, strike three call, you know? So you're going to make people swing the bat. You got to have good enough stuff to do that um, in and out of the zone. So uh, certainly for us to have a, a closer with his 2019 resume is, is important to us. And uh, yeah, so certain, you know, so it's, it's one player, but certainly we looked at many, many other players and, in those three leagues, including Taiwan as well. So really the four, four leagues. Um, and then also had our eye on some guys in, in, in some independent leagues in the States too. So we, we just feel like we have a massive pool. And, and, and as we, as we focus those selections, you know, we, we think we're making good selections at, at any point. You mentioned Casey Coleman having to come off the roster and a couple of these uh, big leaders only being able to put on the roster after the conclusion of the regular season. How much of this is, a, is an ever-shifting, ever-evolving roster? Like, when do you get your first player locked in, and when is the whole <laughs> roster finally locked in? Yeah, right. there, there was, there, there was, like I said, right after the All-Star game, we started moving. So I, could, I couldn't tell you who, you know, who... The, you know, Kratz was early in, in the process, but we, you know, we, we thought he may be a call up. You know, we thought he may be a trade, a traded player. So to, to go to the big league. So we invited him, but we also kept our fingers crossed um, for our team, but also in our hearts, knowing that if he did get called up, that's what he also wants to get back to the big leagues and we'd, we'd be happy for him and we'd, we'd go to the next catcher on the list. So, um, you know, there's all things, all kinds of things that, that could happen. You know, there's there was there was other players that we didn't publicize that you know that you know that were on the roster that were called up. So, um, you know, we think we're doing our job. You know, a lot of times we do joke around that we know we're on the right guy because we'll we'll invite him and the next day or two he gets called up to the big leagues. So we we think our committees are doing a great job because that happens quite often. With that, a lot of these players, the hope, of course, is that this team goes out and, and shows well at Premier 12 and ultimately qualifies for the 2020 Olympics. Um, obviously, you'd like to keep a, a relatively similar roster that you used to qualify for when the Olympics would actually come around. But when you have a lot of these guys who are in AA and AAA and are top prospects, there's a very real chance they'll be called up by the time the Olympics yeah. roll around next, uh, next July it, and it, August. It is, and, and we don't know. We don't yet know if the Olympics, you know, 2008, the criteria to go to the Olympics was a non 25 man roster player. We don't know what the criteria will be between, between the world baseball softball confederation and major league baseball. We don't know what the criteria will be. Uh, but certainly, you know, we, Hey, we, Brad Young puts out a release all the time. When, when, when our alumni go to the big leagues, that's a great day. You know, say baseball because the guys are, Guys have played for their national team and they're getting to the pinnacle of their uh, of their profession, and uh, that's where they they want to be. So we're excited for, for them. So you know, uh, roster roster processing is always ongoing. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care where it is. It's 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 an always it's always an ongoing process, and we're fortunate that that uh, you know our our pool is is so great in the United States. With that, I thought it was interesting you mentioned that the rules for selection could change. It was non 40 man players right now, and I think the assumption is it will be the same for the Olympics, but that is not set in stone yet. Not, not that I've seen. Yeah, it may, it may be that it's non 40, but we haven't seen that yet. That's really getting the card ahead of the horse. You know, we need to go. We need to go to the P12 and be the best team from the Americas. That's that's the job in front of us, and uh, and and. and when that happens, you know, if it's if we wake up on November 18th and we're qualified, then we'll begin the process of start looking at how we're going to field a a gold medal Olympic team. So, but until then, you know, it's, it's, you know, we, we really can't put a lot of stock in that until 
until we take care of the qualification process. Absolutely. One step at a time. Well, uh, we look yeah. forward to seeing how it shakes out. Training camp opens next week, and then the U.S. begins their attempt to qualify for the Olympics November 2nd in Mexico. And we look forward to seeing what this very talented team can do on the international stage. Eric Campbell, General Manager, USA Baseball, thank you so, so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and best of luck in the coming weeks. All right. Thanks, Scott. Once again, that was Eric Campbell, General Manager of the Team USA National Baseball Team. That will be going to Mexico to try and qualify for the Olympics in the Premier 12 tournament. If Team USA succeeds there, they'll move on to Japan for the second round and uh, potentially the championship round as well. We'll be watching their progress closely. I will be out in Arizona next week at their training camp reporting day-to-day everything that's happening with the team. Uh, We've already had one major move. Joe Girardi, who was announced as the manager for Team USA, has stepped down to pursue Major League Baseball managerial opportunities. Scott Brocious will now take over as manager for Team USA. So a lot of developments ahead, a lot more still to come. And uh, keep it here at Baseball America for all the latest coming from Team USA. Once again, we'd like to thank Eric Campbell for joining us on this edition of the Baseball America podcast. Go ahead and give us a review on iTunes, Spotify, whatever platform you're listening on. We'd love to hear from you. For Eric Campbell, I'm Kyle Glazer. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you.